Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this Sabbath side webinar about AI in ophthalmology. My name is Nicholas Jackard. I'm the principal AI architect at Orbis, and I will also be joined by Dr. Danieli, who is a professor in ophthalmology, a medical advisor at CyberSide, and also a longtime uh, volunteer at Orbis. So what can you expect today uh, from the webinar? We're going to start with a non-technical introduction to artificial intelligence. We will then look at how AI has been and will be applied in ophthalmology and eye care. We will do an overview of ethical concerns around the use of AI in general and in healthcare in particular. And then we'll um, go on to do a live demonstration of our AI-enabled CyberSci console features. Uh, and then at the end, we'll have a live Q&A for any question you may have about all of this. So let's start by a brief introduction about um, artificial intelligence and machine learning in, uh, in general. So artificial intelligence is defined as the ability of a computer program or a machine to think like humans do. And this, this remains science fiction as of yet, but we have a really good approximation of it. And this is called machine learning. And what ma my machine learning is, is the ability of um, giving a machine or a computer program uh, the skill to learn from examples without being explicitly programmed to do so. And I will explain what that means in a couple of slides. And then the third term I want to introduce you to is called is deep learning, which again is a subset of machine learning. And it's a technique that's seen a lot of success in the recent years. And pretty much nowadays when we talk about machine learning and AI to a certain extent, we typically refer to uh, a variation of deep learning. So I will also explain what that is in a few slides. So I would like you to think of machine learning as a tool set to solve really hard problems. And some of them are here on the left-hand side. So we have um, language understanding, we have computer vision, we have speech recognition or robotics. And the... Um, Let's say you want to solve computer vision, which is a really hard problem. It's basically the ability to give machines or computers, um, uh, give machine or computers the ability to see like humans do or animals do. And if you want to tackle this problem, you may want to start, for example, with physics. You want to understand how light refracts and works. Um, and for example, how the optics of a camera will work and try to replicate this uh, in your computer program. Or you may want to look at neuroscience again, inspired by how biology does it and how human visions actually work. Um, but another tool you can use in addition to physics and neuroscience would be, for example, machine learning. And in turn, machine learning has multiple methods uh, associated with it. And the one we're going to talk about today is called deep learning. As you will see, it's a method that's been very successful I've, at um, enabling computer vision and making it a big success um, in our day-to-day -day lives. So I'm going to start by explaining what exactly makes machine learning different from any other kind of uh, traditional computer programs. So the example we're going to use is we're going to have a program uh, shown as by this box here that will classify images of cats and dogs. So you start with a image of a cat coming in and then the computer will say, yep, this is a cat in that image. And similarly for dog images, you will give that image to the, com uh, to the program and then the program can say, yep, this is a dog. And this is something that will happen, for example, uh, nowadays on phones or if you take a photo, sometimes they will be able to tell you what the content of that photo is. So it's a similar programs to those. Um, the way you would traditionally do it with a, no, uh, like a regular computer program is, you will sit down and think really hard about the difference of, uh, between cats and dogs. And once you, um, you have a reason, reasonable list of differences, you will formalize that list uh, in the form of computer code. Um, so basically you will explicitly program your computer to recognize cats and dogs based, based on the rules that you just came up with. And then at the end, you get your program that will be able to classify cats and dogs and photograph. When you use machine learning, it's a very different approach. So what you start with is you start by collecting a bunch of data. Luckily, we're using cats and dogs, so uh, finding data on the internet shouldn't be too difficult. So you have a bunch of uh, pictures of cats um, and a bunch of pictures of, of dogs. And the next step is something we call labeling. So you, you tell 
uh, the computer that all these images here are images of cats and all the images here are images of dogs. And taken together, this is called a data set. So it's a collection of data with the corresponding label in our, in our cases, cats and dogs. And the next step is to give all that data, so our data set to what we call a machine learning algorithm. And this process is called training. And basically during that process, the machine learning algorithm will learn the best possible uh, rules to differentiate between cats and dogs. It doesn't know anything about cats and dogs. It was never programmed to know anything about cats and dogs, but because it's able to learn from examples, it will learn to do the, the differentiation by itself and find the best possible rules to do it. And then you end up a program, which might be very similar. The output might be similar, but the way where you got to it is very different. In one, you had to explicitly tell the computer what cats and dogs are, in the, other, in the other example, the computer was able to learn by itself based on examples. And this is really make, what makes machine learning uh, so different from the traditional computer programs. So before we proceed, I'm going to take a little detour um, and talk about benchmarks in computer vision. So I was talking about data sets, uh, which are collections of data. And when a group or a company uh, come up with a new AI algorithm, typically what you want to do is to evaluate on public data sets so that you know whether you're better than uh, the state of the art that you try to, to beat. And when a, a data set becomes very popular, they're called, typically called benchmarks. And every year around benchmarks, we have challenges that are organized. Sometimes they're part of conferences and sometimes they're just organized online. And uh, there is this particular challenge called the ImageNet Large Scale Visual Recognition Challenge, which consists in classifying 1.2 million images, so it's a very large data set, uh, into one of a thousand categories. And here you have a few examples of these categories. So, for example, you have a red fox, you have a hamster, uh, or you have a stingray. And basically, the computer is given one of these images and is, um, should come up with the right category for that image. And this challenge was used to be thought as extremely difficult. And uh, we, we thought it would take decades before a computer could actually solve it um, uh, near human performance, which is about 95% accuracy. And you can see here on the left, a plot of the error. So 20% error, 26% error in 2011. Uh, this is about 74% accuracy. So we are very far from humans in, in 2011. In 2012, however, uh, machine learning was almost reinvented. Uh, what happened is a group from University of Toronto uh, came up with a new version of an existing method, which was called artificial neural networks. And they made a few tweaks to that method um, and used it in a very smart way. And uh, they came up with something called convolutional neural networks and deep learning. And we're going to discuss that on the next slide to tell you ex what exactly those terms mean. But it's important, just important to see that uh, there was a huge gain in performance as soon as this technique was introduced. You can see here, we jumped from 26% error to 16% error. And every single of these data points following 2012 uh, were using deep learning methods as well, or variants of deep learning. And the interesting point is to see that after 2014, we can see that this horizontal line here is a human error. And after 2014, we actually achieved superhuman performance. So these algorithms were actually better at this task that your average uh, human would be, uh, which is uh, a, a theme of these uh, convolutional neural networks, which are able to achieve superhuman performance on a variety of tasks. So what exactly is deep learning and what are convolutional neural networks? And we use CNN for short for convolutional neural networks. And here's an example for computer vision, but similar methods are applicable to, for example, uh, natural language processing or sound processing. Any kind of problem of this uh, category would be, uh, you would be able to use, apply deep learning to. So in this case, uh, we want to categorize to um, our computer to be able to tell us what, um, uh, breed of a dog is on a photograph. And in this case, we start with this photo here. Uh, the machine sees it as a slightly different to us. It sees it at three channels. So we are red and green and blue channel. And then what happens is we have our neural network, which is represented here by, by these stack layers. And it's not a, um, a coincidence that this is very similar to how human vision 
actually works. We also use stacked of neurons uh, to, uh, to be able to see, and this is inspired by that. And uh, such, similar to human vision, the complexity and the layer as abstraction goes up the deeper you go into your network. So how it works is the first layer will look at your image and detect things that are very simple image features. So for example, edges. And then the second layer will go up in complexity. And instead of just looking at edges, we look at shapes, which are a group of edges. And then maybe the third layer, we look at textures, uh, which are very helpful to look at, for example, the fur coat of a, of a dog. And then by, by the time you get to the fourth layer, it might be very good at detecting dogs. So doing a dog versus non-dog kind of classification. And then by the time you get to layer five, you get a very good dog breed detector. And then it's able to tell you that, okay, I have 83% confidence that this is a, a Husky. And the important bit about this is that it's called deep learning because um, uh, there are multiple layers uh, in, into the, the architecture. So in, in this case, it's five, but nowadays you can imagine you have networks that are 150, 200, 300 layers deep. And as I mentioned, the deeper you go, the more abstraction you go and the more specialized your neurons will be. So there's this notion that the deeper you go, the better your algorithm will perform. And they're called convolutional neural networks because the type of connections between these neurons are called convolutions, which is a, a math mathematical operation that is very well suited for image, image uh, applications, which is, makes it all of these very efficient and something that a few years ago or 10 years ago would take weeks to run, we can now run it in hours or minutes. So this was a huge revolution in the field of machine learning. And it was quickly followed by big headlines and all of those are related to deep learning. Uh, the first one I wanted to mention is in 2016, an AI beat a Go player. Uh, so it's a, it was a, a grandmaster, so one of the best player in the world. And the AI beat it and it was a big, a big thing because Go, unlike chess, was thought to be almost impossible for a machine to reach human performance. But it turned out that this AI just beat the best player in the world in 2016. And then in 2019, a similar result where an AI won at a uh, video game, which is a, it's called Dota 2, it's a five versus five strategy game. And what is not worthy here is that it's not only a one-on-one -on -one game like a Go or chess, it's five on five, which means that the AI beat five human players and also um, had to coordinate five of, of, of its five AI versions to coordinate and play together to beat the human players. And this was the first time this was achieved. And this was a big deal. And uh, more recently, in, at the end of 2020, there was the big break breakthrough of AI being used to solve protein structures. So this is very interesting because protein structures underlie most of our understanding of biology, but also it's a big thing in drug discovery. So this will this might pos possibly lead to more drugs and better drugs being discovered uh, th through these breakthroughs. So you can see that uh, AI had a huge impact already and especially deep learning uh, was this huge revolution in machine learning just took off in, in a matter of years. Uh, now I'm going to discuss how these advances are currently being used in ophthalmology and how they will be used in the future. So the first thing to know is most of the applications nowadays in, in uh, ophthalmology are imaging based. So they will look at fundus photographs, such as the top one here, or OCT scan here at the bottom. Um, although there are also areas such as uh, patient management, disease risk predictions, progression analysis, and automated interpretation of non-imaging modalities, such as visual field tests. But those are relatively rare, and most of the uh, application will be diagnostics based on these two modalities, so 2D and 3D data. And very early on, AI became a very big uh, interest in AI in healthcare. Uh, ophthalmology became a very big interest in AI in healthcare. And these are four reasons why that might be. Um, first of all, there's plentiful data. Uh, we can acquire uh, image of the eye very non-intrusively, non-invasively. When you compare that to an MRI or a PET scan, um, certainly uh, acquiring a fundus or a CT scan is much, much easier and faster and less intrusive for the patient. And there's a reason why there's a lot of data to work with, which is a requirement to use these more uh, advanced techniques just as deep learning. 
Um, there's also the big familiarity with technology. Uh, ophthalmologists and healthcare professionals working in ophthalmology and eye care are very familiar with remote diagnosis, diagnosis so using telemedicine and various decision tools. So for example, modern phonus cameras would have um, kind of tools that help you uh, do better, uh, make better decisions through visualizations or other tools. Um, ophthalmology and fundus uh, in particular is used at all levels of healthcare systems. So whether you do community screening or you are a general practitioner in primary care or a, a, an hospital, a secondary care hospital or a highly specialized tertiary care um, uh, institution, uh, fundus is used across all of these levels, which means that um, there's a very big incentive to solve it uh, and to apply AI because then it will be usable at various level of care versus, for example, MRI scanners will, will probably be only useful in secondary and tertiary care. Um, and the last one is there are existing use cases for AI to be used in ophthalmology. Um, there's a lot of workflows such as multi-graders workflow for screening programs or triaging workflows that could already use AI uh, as to replace, for example, one of the graders. And that would not need uh, to rethink the entire workflow. We could use exactly the same workflow that we use today, but replacing one of the graders, for example, by an AI or a machine learning algorithm. So uh, there have been in my, I would like to present three big landmarks, uh, landmark moments in AI and ophthalmology and eye care. And the first one is in 2016, when I was talking about the importance of benchmark and benchmark tend to spur uh, research and create a lot of interest for a given field in machine learning. And in 2016, there was a really large data set at the time, about 100,000 images uh, that was released for diabetic retinopathy. It has really created a big sense of excitement for AI in ophthalmology and machine learning in ophthalmology. And you will see many, many academic groups and commercial organizations trying to use this data set to uh, create diabetic retinopathy grading algorithms. And even to this day, so this was five years ago, you still see papers that almost monthly coming out that use this data set as a basis for their work. Um, another big landmark moment was uh, also in 2016 when uh, DeepMind, which is a subsidiary of Google, announced a research partnership with Moorfield Eye Hospital in London. And it was really a really big moment because this is when big tech, so you know, Google is not a small company, um, is entering the game of AI and eye care. So it shows that there's a lot of interest in that field. It's, it doesn't, it's not just academic anymore. There's really a, uh, an interest from a commercialization, commercialization standpoint. And then in 2018, um, the FDA approved a, um, a, an AI-based medical device for the detection of diabetic retinopathy. And this was a big deal because this was the first um, AI-enabled medical device that was approved by the FDA. And this was in eye care for ophthalmology. And this was a time when this went from really being a research or academic field to something that can be used to uh, screen patients and diagnose patients uh, day to day uh, as part of a clinical workflow. So it was a really big date in AI and ophthalmology. So since then, there's been this race to match expert performance. So the same way I was talking about ImageNet and how we got superhuman performance, this is something that is happening as well in ophthalmology. And the two main areas of uh, application for this race are diabetic retinopathy and glaucoma. And you can see on this plot that uh, there's a lot of interest in both of those uh, in AMD as well. And then uh, slightly less for, for example, cataract or, or ROP. And um, across all those, most of the studies you're going to see are going to claim they have superhuman performance. Uh, so they are better than uh, human clinical experts at a particular task. Uh, while that may be true, it's actually extremely difficult to prove um, that just because as everything in, in uh, AI in healthcare, um, there's a lot of variability between uh, clinicians. So clinicians tend to not agree on a given diagnosis. And that makes it really difficult to uh, demonstrate that AI is actually superhuman, uh, for example, in ophthalmology. And I invite all of you to be very critical about papers that claim they, are superhuman, they have superhuman performance, because uh, most of the time, while it might be true, 
uh, they haven't shown uh, sufficient um, data to demonstrate that it's actually the case. And as always, uh, the proof is in the pudding. And I, I personally think that we should only think of an AI system to be uh, a success if it demonstrates actual benefits to patients uh, on the field, on the ground, in real world clinical settings. And this is extremely rare. There are very, very few examples to this date that shown that it's actually beneficial to use AI uh, as part of real world clinical setting. Um, I also encourage all of you and in general that uh, to the fact that there should be education of clinicians in this area. So machine learning and deep learning uh, so that clinicians can critically evaluate new AI systems uh, and make sure that they really fully understand what a system is and is capable of before thinking of deploying it. So um, deploying AI is a very hard problem. And uh, Google uh, experienced it when they tried to deploy a, an algorithm that was high, very uh, performing really well in a laboratory context and then deployed it on the ground in Thailand. And it turned out it was performing very poorly. And the reason for that is as soon as you go out of the uh, ideal condition of the lab, uh, it becomes very difficult and results are extremely unpredictable. And this is very uh, important to think about it because we typically only have one chance to get it right. If we deploy AI, it does terribly and the, the outcome is not an improvement for the patient or even worse, it's detrimental to the patient. Um, you lose all the trust from the system, so from both clinicians and from patients. So you really have to get it right so that you gain that trust and you do, basically you do things correctly and everyone uh, buy into uh, the idea of having AI deployed as a cl in clinical workflows. And um, I think we should dream bigger than diagnosis. And those are two uh, potential applications that have been demonstrated. Uh, one is detection of systemic outcome from fundus photographs. So it's, for example, being able to tell if someone is hypertensive or, for example, if someone is likely to suffer from a major cardiac event in the next five years just based on a fundus photograph. And also um, progression analysis. And this is an example where AI was used to predict whether uh, a dry AMD will convert to wet AMD. And I understand, I'm not an ophthalmologist, but I understand this is something that is difficult to do. Um, and uh, having an AI that is able to do it will be extremely useful. And this is a kind of um, areas where I think AI can outperform humans, uh, not just diagnostics, but uh, coming up with new ways to use that data that we already have available. So in order, before I finish on this bit, I will uh, leave you with the top four ways I think AI could impact IK in, in the medium term. Um, first of all is decision support. So AI will be there to make sure that clinicians and healthcare professionals never miss anything and they can provide the best possible care to their patients. Uh, AI will be used to discover new biomarkers uh, that will allow, allow for early and more accurate diagnosis of eye conditions. AI will be extremely helpful when it comes to screening or triaging of patients, especially in, in um, uh, low resourced areas. And then finally, in something that is not uh, discussed as much is I, I think that AI will be very helpful and useful when it comes to training and mentoring as well. So uh, before we continue, I so we'll run a quick poll. So we will be able to answer, uh, to give your opinion on this. Um, this is about asking what best describes your feelings uh, regarding AI in ophthalmology. And you have a few choices here. You have excitement, fear, indifference, conclusion, uh, confusion, sorry, and nothing in particular. And we are very interested to know what you think about these different um, uh, terms and how you feel about AI in ophthalmology in general, uh, just because this is something we are very interested in at, uh, at CyberSight and knowing, um, uh, knowing what our audience think about it will be very helpful um, uh, in the future. And hopefully it will not be fear. Um, okay, it's excitement, so that's good. 82% excitement um, and then confusion as the next follow-up. So hopefully some of this today will help, help clear the confusion, uh, but I'm, I'm very happy to see that is uh, uh, 
by a, a large majority is excitement. So this is what we want to see. Um, okay, so very briefly before we go on to the demonstration, I wanted to very quickly touch on kind of the ethical considerations around AI in general. Uh, this is a really big topic and this is something that underlies everything we do in AI at Orbis. And um, I wanted to make it very clear that uh, unlike what you might think, uh, AI tends to amplify prejudices and biases. So if you count on AI to, for example, uh, minimize those, uh, I think it will be mistaken. And two big examples that came out recently is that an example, for example, Amazon were using an AI to screen a candidate for jobs they were advertising. And the AI tended to favor men, so they were discriminating, uh, biasing against women um, trying to apply for jobs. So they had to scrap this AI uh, recruiting tool. And maybe more, way more concerning is a risk algorithm that is used in the US uh, as part of a healthcare system um, was uh, heavily biased against black patients. Um, and um, again, those are prejudices and biases that are existing outside of AI, but AI basically amplifies these biases and prejudices. So we have, very, we have to be very, very careful about that. And um, I think the take home message that I would like uh, is that all AI algorithms are biased in a way or another. And I think it's on, on us, uh, developers of AIs and promoters of AI to make sure that we minimize that bias as much as possible. And very quickly, there are two types of bias. There are data bias, which means that machine learning algorithms are extremely good at finding any pattern in your data. And if, if any of, that, uh, of those patterns are biases or prejudi uh, prejudices against a, give, a given demographics, the machine learning will find it and uh, potentially amplify it. So you have to be very careful about what is in your data and that your data should be as much as possible free of any biases. And the second bit is, it's more of an algorithm, algorithmic bias, is that the methods used to train these algorithms are designed to extract as much performance as possible, and potentially at the cost of other factors, such as ethical factors or ethical considerations. So it's not always the best way to achieve, to try to achieve, for example, superhuman performance, if it means that you're going to be biased against a given demographics. So keep exam in mind, uh, all this when it comes to AI, I have a few values and here's an example of them. Uh, we value fairness over performance. We build for everyone. Orbis is a very, very large audience and we have to make sure that what we produce works for everyone. And we try to build fairness right into what we're doing through better education, uh, having diverse teams and following and suggesting industry-wide standards to make sure that all of this become a uh, standard practice across the industry. So before we go on to the uh, hands-on, uh, we'll quickly introduce what you're going to see. So uh, at Orbis, we, our, our motto when it comes to AI is that we want to leave no one behind the AI revolution. And the way we're doing this is we are democratizing access to AI uh, with the aim to benefit our patients and partners around the world. And we have this initiative called CyberSide AI, and what we're going to show you today is how we can be used for clinical decision support. Um, but we also are working on application uh, related to, to teaching and mentoring using AI. And the way it works is uh, AI is built into CyberSight Consult and it can be used today uh, free of charge uh, for any of our users, of our CyberSight Consult users. And I just wanted to clarify that um, you may have a CyberSight account that is only for the, to access our learning libraries. Um, if that's the case, you will need to be upgraded by uh, our support staff to make it a full CyberSight Consult account. So if you try to access CyberSight Consult and the AI features and you can't, uh, please, to, uh, please uh, contact support and they, they will walk through the, um, the process to upgrade your account to make it eligible to access those features. But once you have this account, it's accessible free of charge, but it's always an option. We never send data to the AI unless you explicitly want us to do so. And the way it works is when you, patient, you submit a patient case on CyberSight Consult, as a mentee, you submit a patient case to CyberSight Consult that will go to your mentor. 
and then you will get recommendation and then you have this kind of conversation going on with your mentor. If you want to opt in, you can also send that data to the AI and then you will receive within a few minutes an AI report that contains kind of highlights of the uh, interpretation by the AI. And then you can look at that report right away and also discuss that report with your mentor and use that kind of as a basis for your conversation with the mentor. The second option you have is to use uh, newly introduced AI on the cases. Whereas a mentee, you can submit an AI case as I will go to CyberSide Consult, it will get the same AI report back to you, but it doesn't involve your mentor uh, at this stage. So if you have any question or you're confused about the AI report or you're not sure what to do next, you can always create a patient case from that page. And it's very important for us that there's always a human that is very that can be in the loop uh, in case you are uh, you need you need one to help you. And we're going to do more to see more about this on the hands-on in a in a minute. But uh, the AI report uh, content includes information about disk anomalies, the vertical cup to disk ratio. Uh, macular anomalies uh, and information about DR grading as well following the international grading scheme. So you will see more about this in a second, but just to give you a, um, um, an idea of what we expect in terms of data, this is an, a, an example of funders that is a perfect example of what we, we want to see as input data to uh, CyberSide Consult AI features. And very briefly, um, what we want to see as input is a 45 to 60 degrees fundus photograph. Uh, so this is typical uh, field of view for a, a fundus photograph, such as this one. Um, it has to be macular centered, although this centered also, also works, but it's not optimal. Uh, it has to be a high quality export from a camera software directly. It is one fundus on the file, such as the one I just showed you. It has nothing else in the file, such as text or manual annotations. Um, and it has to be in a support file format. We have JPEG, PNG, and TIFF file formats are supported. What it, we're not compatible with are SLO or wide field images, such as this Optos image here. We are not uh, supporting OCT scans being uploaded, uh, camera patient reports, such as this one. So those are typically generated by your camera software directly. We do not support those. We want a fundus export from it instead of a, the, the report directly. Um, we do not support screen photographs. So this one, this one is an example of taking a photo of the screen uh, because this typically leads to lower quality that is not sufficient for AI grading. Uh, we do not support visual field reports and we do not support fundus montages with uh, montage, which is just this one, uh, where you have multiple funders that's been put together to form a mosaic. Uh, that being said, um, we welcome you to upload any of the data and the software will also let you know if the data is not suitable for upload. So on that note, uh, this is it for me. I will uh, come back when it comes to the uh, Q&A and I'm handing it to uh, Dan for the rest. Thank you, Nicholas. Well, so Nicholas is an AI engineer or AI architect and uh, I'm talking to you as a clinician, as an ophthalmologist. And I think it's important that we always keep that loop intact because simply having a tool uh, is, is different than being able to apply a tool correctly. As you can see, AI is just in its infancy. Uh, this is not the birth of AI, but in terms of AI and ophthalmology, we're talking in the last five years. So this really is the ground floor. And it's something that is going to change so rapidly, just like a young child growing uh, from infancy. This is just going to be a logarithmic change every six months to a year. And here we are, we're, we're offering this to you free, um, which is, I think, just an amazing benefit to Orbis CyberSight. What I'm going to do is demonstrate to you in real time, submitting uh, a couple AI consultations. And these, um, I just want you to keep in mind with what, as you look at all of this AI and as you use the AI consultation feature, it's not going to be perfect, all right? This is, a, this is a supplemental tool. This is not designed to replace being a physician, but this is to guide you. And I see, I see the potential of AI here to be most beneficial in a couple of areas. One is screening, so mass screening of fundus photographs or, or other images, 
to determine who, who needs to see a physician. And then um, the other group are the people that you're already seeing uh, using AI to help you guide your diagnosis based on the information that's input. And then once you have uh, been helped with your diagnosis, then guiding your treatment plan. So things like preferred practice patterns, all right? If you have, if you now have a diagnosis of, uh, of uh, diabetic retinopathy, what are the preferred practice patterns for that? What, what should you be doing now? And again, always with the understanding that you're the doctor, you need to make the decision or you need to ask your mentor to help you decipher this information if it's not clear. Um, what are we doing right now? Well, currently we offer AI services in, in just two categories and that's glaucoma optic nerve head analysis, glaucoma screening. And then the other category is, uh, is in the field of diabetic retinopathy for both adults and children. And so when you are submitting cases, you will see that those are the only areas where you're able to submit a case from. And uh, let me, I'll share my screen and we'll just go to the home screen and start in on this. Um, and, and as we look at this home screen, so this is the home screen if you have a CyberSight consultation account, all right? If you just have the library and course access, you will need to change your account to a full access consultation account. And when you do, this was what will show up. You'll see a list of ongoing consultations. Uh, you'll see cases that you can search by category and you'll see your own your own cases up here. So you need to be able to see this screen to submit a request. When you want to submit a request, you can either use the red submit a new request button or down here on the sidebar, uh, you, you have the ability to go through there. Now, when you open this up, there will be a couple options, all right? So general question doesn't apply to this, just patient cases. So we have an AI only case where it is not automatically submitted to a teaching mentor. Uh, so this will be like if you're screening for glaucoma or just screening for fundus photographs or diabetic retinopathy. Or you can use AI interpretation as part of a case that you are submitting to a mentor. So you have a diabetic patient and uh, you're submitting it to a mentor for advice. Well, while you're waiting for that uh, result to come back, you will be getting an AI report generated instantly almost. So uh, and when I say instantly, I'm talking less than a minute perhaps. So let's just start off with an AI only case. Uh, this is a new feature, by the way. We've offered AI interpretation maybe for uh, more than a year now, but the AI only feature is just the last few months. So AI only case. And Again, on the subspecialty drop-down box, you're going, only going to see these three categories. All right, it's retina or it's glaucoma. So there's glaucoma, and then I have the option of choosing files. And I'm going to choose a normal right here, and I'm going to choose one uh, that is not normal. Upload those. All right, so those are uploaded. I have my preview. Once I have my preview, then I submit. All right. Now it's already uh, in the works. I'll go back to my home screen and this will appear in my in progress cases for me. And while we're waiting for that, I'll go ahead and let's launch the first, uh, the first poll question here, Lawrence. All right, so this is something important for us to know because here we are, we're talking about AI grading of fundus photographs. So step number one here, I'd just like to hear from the audience. Do you have access to a fundus camera that can take a decent photograph? Yes or no? Obviously this is important because if you have a bad image or no image, then the AI is not going to be of much use to you. So, um, uh, the old saying garbage in garbage out. All right, so good. Most of us, most of us have uh, access to a decent fundus camera. And the quality of the picture is important as you submit these things. Um, 
All right, here's that AI only case that we just submitted. We got it opened up here and I'm just hitting my screen refresh. All right, and so here's our report. In the span of uh, about a minute, we have received our AI report. So this is an AI only case. So all I'm receiving is the AI report here. And we have image one and image two. Um, and again, as uh, Nicholas showed that preview, very first thing you get on this summary is, was your image verified and was it gradable, okay? You have to have good images, otherwise the, the system can't interpret them for you, right? And then um, it's giving you a summary, it, uh, disc anomalies and diabetic retinopathy. So I think that's another important point here. Uh, we, we're selecting categories of glaucoma or diabetic retinopathy, but the system is performing both screenings on every image that you submit, all right? So you don't, you don't have to be accurate on which of those drop downs you use, but that's, those are the categories that we can use. It will run the analysis on all images, both for DR and for glaucoma. And then if you see that everything is green, you don't even need to look at the images, but if there are abnormalities like we have here, and I'm gonna scroll down to the second image, which is the normal image first. So here we have a normal image uh, the disc is highlighted and you will get, I think this is a really nice feature. You will get a vertical cup to disc ratio estimated for you. So here, this one's being estimated at uh, 0 0.55 vertical cup to disc ratio. And so I think that's, that's a nice tool that not just for screening, but this is something that you could use in managing your glaucoma patients. No, that's limited information, obviously, but it is one more tool where you can monitor the consistent objective AI cup to disc ratio for you and your patients over time. All right, macula, no macula abnormalities were detected, no diabetic retinopathy was detected, no microaneurysms, exudates, or hemorrhages. Okay, so that's a normal report. And uh, I'll just go back to that. So why is that, um, why is that yellow? Well, this one's yellow because this cup to disc ratio was 0.55, all right? In this case, we know it's just a physiologic cup, but because it's greater than what we typically expect to see, this cautionary yellow flag is appearing, all right? And again, you're the physician. You need to take all the information into account. This is simply, highlighting something that maybe we should pay attention to because it's a little bit outside normal limits. All right. The other image that we submitted is actually one that, that we know is abnormal. And you'll get that same kind of assessment here. Disc anomalies, it's the machine is just in this highlighting purple showing some areas that it detected were outside of normal limits. Right? Uh, and then we have again that vertical cup to disc ratio this time much larger 0 0.75 all right so this is well outside normal limits and so we've got a red flag on that and if you scroll back you can see the areas of the disc in particular that the ai program is is highlighting all right so this is a glaucoma suspect at this point um, that would need further evaluation uh, the macula is normal no evidence of diabetic retinopathy uh, you can see that the machine picked up on a couple of microaneurysms, and these are quite small, but uh, when magnified, you can see there's a microaneurysm right here. And then this one's a little more difficult for me to find, but uh, so here you go. Uh, you can see how even subtle things that I think clinically, uh, at least I would probably miss in a cursory glance, um, it's highlighting those and bringing those to your attention. So really a super tool. And you can just imagine how this can be utilized maybe for glaucoma screening uh, administered by um, non-ophthalmic personnel or even a camera kiosk set up in a, a pharmacy or a grocery. All right, so that's an example of 
uh, an AI only glaucoma case. Let's do another one. I'll go to the sidebar this time. Um, I will start it as an AI only case, but I'll show you how that can convert to, um, to a uh, full consult. And in this case, we're going to go retina vitreous. I'll choose my files. And I've got a couple here on my desktop. I'll use this diabetic and this diabetic. These are not the same patient. All right, so normally uh, if we were submitting photos, we're gonna use the same patient. But for example purposes here, I've got two separate photos, even though they're a right and left eye and they're taken on different camera systems as well. All right, so that's been submitted back to my cases. And um, my in progress cases here. All right, so my, my report is, I can see it confirmed that it's submitted and I see that it's pending. Let's go ahead and launch our second poll question. Our images are there and we will be waiting for our report to come up. All right, so this is just a follow up on the fundus camera question because I'm curious as to what's out there. Um, if you do have a fundus camera, that 60 some percent of you that had a fundus camera, um, if you could, in the Q&A box, please um, go ahead and type in the type of camera or the brand of camera or the name of the camera. Um, otherwise, uh, so go ahead and answer the poll here. If you don't have one, of course, don't have one. Uh, if you have one but don't know the name, go ahead and respond that. So we just have that information. And then again, type in the, the kind of camera you have in the Q&A. All right, so we'll, uh, we'll take a look at that. Um, it's not critical for what we're doing here, uh, but I would like to look at that. All right, so we have our, um, I need to move my bar here. It's hiding my refresh. Just a second, there we go. All right, so screen is refreshed and I have my AI report. All right, so now, we can see a lot of the uh, images again are verified and gradable. We, we put in decent images. Uh, we are getting an error on the disc uh, for one side and then we're getting a nice normal report on the other disc. And then both of these images are showing up as abnormal for diabetic retinopathy. So we're gonna wanna take a look at those images and I'll just go to this first image. All right, and it's, um, showing our image here and you can see it's, the system is highlighting these macular abnormalities. And then uh, we're getting a diagnosis of severe diabetic retinopathy uh, based on the amount of uh, retinopathy changes in the locations. Here, we're highlighting some, uh, again, microaneurysms in the boxes around those are where the machine has identified the microaneurysms in addition to the exudates and cotton wool spots. Uh, there's highlighting of the exudates and highlighting of the hemorrhages, all right? Now, let's go to our second image. All right, image one, image one, and then image two. All right, so we've got our disc is coming out normal. And uh, this would also pick up neovascularization of the disc if we had that. We have a nice normal disc. We also have a nice normal cup to disc ratio here. It's being measured as uh, 0 0.17. So totally within normal. But again, once again, our macular anomaly score, we're finding changes which are significantly anomalous. Those are being highlighted. And then the machine algorithm goes into the grading um, and based on the number and extent of exudates and hemorrhages, uh, we're getting a, a report of severe diabetic, non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Now, well, I think one could look at these images and findings and, and say, was well, this moderate or severe? But, and that's where the physician's input needs to come in. 
the machine is highlighting the changes. It is uh, based on that information, doing the best it can to grade it. But ultimately, the physician is the authority there. And when we look at correspondence for uh, grading diabetic retinopathy with this program versus human graders, uh, there, when you're when the severity is at the uh, kind of moderate and above level, the correspondence with the human graders is about 90%. So that's not bad. And that, uh, Nicholas can speak more to that if we have questions uh, during the Q&A. Again, the exudates and then the hemorrhages. Here we have just one small dot hemorrhage. All right. So we've looked at that and I'm like, okay, well, those seem like moderate diabetic retinopathy to me. I'm not sure if it's severe. I'm not sure if I need to treat this patient. Um, now that I've done that AI analysis, um, I think I'd like to get an opinion from one of my mentors at Orbis. So here you go at the bottom. Um, oh, and here, let me just show you the original images that we used. Here's the original right eye. Let me just open it. And if you go to large, I can just zoom in. All right, so there's the original right eye. And then again, here's the uh, original left eye. All right, so you can open them full resolution or smaller and zoom in. All right, so these are the like our cotton wool spots, our hard exudates, and then the few scattered hemorrhages. Uh, no neovascularization was highlighted. So that's an, another part of the port if it's present. And it will show you where that's located. All right, so here I'm like, ah, I'm not sure if I need to treat this patient or just watch them. So down here at the bottom, resubmit case for human consult. Okay, uh, so I'm clicking on that. It's informing me that I'm now going to submit it for human review. But it's also telling me that I still have access to my report. Okay, so in my case files, I'll still be able to pull this up. I'm like, yeah, cool. I want uh, I want some feedback from uh, one of my retina colleagues. All right. So, so now one thing it doesn't do this looks now just like a blank empty new case, just like if I had uh, uh, was starting a case all over. It doesn't pre-populate anything at this time. So I'm back to a new patient case. And then I'll just go back again to retina vitreous. I'm gonna send this to myself so it doesn't go out live into the system. And um, when you submit consults, you know, I'm just going through, there's a lot of stuff you can put in on here, right? But what you have to put in is you have to put in the red asterisks, okay? So we need a case category. We need an age, right? Pretty basic stuff. I'll just put in male. I'll put in insulin dependent diabetic uh, for the past 20 years, right? I'm gonna put in some, we have to have a, some history to work on, all right? I'm gonna put that in. All right, this is ophthalmology. We need a visual acuity. So let's put in a visual acuity and you can put it in any form you want anywhere from log more to 20 foot to decimal. All right, many of you use decimal, so I'll just put in two random decimal acuities, but you see we also have other options up here if you can't do that. All right, so that's really all I have to put in to submit a consult other than diabetic My typing is amazing. Diabetic retinopathy treatment, none, but is or does, does this warrant treatment? All right, so I have moderate to severe diabetic retinopathy. Do I need to be doing a Vastin? Do I need to be doing a focal laser? Um, we don't need PRP in this case. All right, choose files. So the choose files, this first one here, this, I'm gonna go back to our same diabetic images there and there, okay? So I'm attaching these to the case. Keep in mind that if I want to run AI interpretation, you have to manually select that. 
In this case, we definitely do because this is a follow-up to our AI only consult. I'm going to click yes. And um, let me move it. go back to my images. You have to then choose which images you want the AI to run on. All right. So there's my two DR images. All right. So now those are appearing there. Why do I have to do this twice? Well, because if some of the other stuff you had put in was not AI, and I don't know if I have any other images here, but uh, let's just say I had accessory images or uh, all right, so I, if this if this image was an OCT or or photograph of the patient's chart or something, I don't want AI analysis running on that. So you are only going to include the ones that are appropriate for AI as, as Nicholas outlined when he's showing you those good sample images. And this is what we want. We want fundus images like this, all right, either centered on the macula or centered on the disc. All right. So at that point, um, you also can submit. I just saved a draft and here goes our submission. Okay, and now that is submitted. And what's happening now? Well, not only are you right now getting another version of that AI report, um, which we didn't have to run again, but I did. Uh, but now we also have a case that's being sent to the to the mentor. And um, in this case, we'll then come back to you for feedback. Right? So you'll get you'll get a, a retina expert's opinion as to whether or not that was truly moderate or was it severe and should you be doing anti-VEGF treatment, should you be doing laser and, and we'll kind of close the loop that way. So I think that's really the, the exciting point we are right now. Um, I do have one more poll question, uh, which we're going to launch. This is where we are now. This is what we can do right now. Um, but what do you want to see next? All of this is going to be fine-tuned, of course. The, the, the glaucoma screening and mapping the contour of the nerve uh, and, and, and maybe some more education in with the diabetic retinopathy grading scale. Uh, that's all going to be fine-tuned. But what do you want to see us do next? Now, click on a couple of these. Or try and prioritize what do you find to be the most exciting. Uh, macular degeneration, dry and wet exudates, uh, or dry, ex uh, dry forms or wet exudates, and, and, and guidance on treatment for ARMD. Uh, ERG interpretation, if you have an ERG and you're not comfortable with generating reports, would you like to see that? Uh, this is an interesting one, uh, glaucoma optic nerve monitoring over time, where you, I talked about being able to look at a nerve and get a grading. Well, what about being able to scroll those nerves over time um, or having a, an ongoing record that you can highlight changes over time? Uh, pediatric refraction prescribing, you have, a, you have a refraction. Now, what do you give based on the strabismus or absence of strabismus? ROP screening, I think this is an exciting one. Um, we will have the ability maybe to screen for plus disease so that uh, a non-physician can take photographs and then um, patients in outlying areas can be triaged and then seen by an ophthalmologist if they have changes. Um, strabismus motility, you know, you could take a nine picture grid and I think AI could probably come up with a diagnosis uh, and then visual field interpretation. All right. All right. So a little bit over the board. Um, yeah, all right. So that'll give us some guidance as to where we go in the future. Um, at this point, I'm going to bring Nicholas back in. I'm going to um, uh, have both of us handle uh, the Q&A session here. Yep, I'm back. Thanks, all right. So Nick, yep, Nicholas is back. And let me open our Q&A. Um, We'll go through these, one of these, uh, any AI system tool to address dry eyes. I'm not aware of any, Nicholas, are you? 
Uh, there is research, certainly seeing some papers on it, but I've never seen any kind of commercial or product to, to do it. So um, my answer is probably there's some research on it. I'm not aware of any kind of systems you can buy and use. So uh, certainly yeah. something that uh, should need more work as well. All right. Is there any AI available other than Pegasus for glaucoma diagnosis? Yeah, so uh, to have a bit of context, Pegasus used to be the name of some of the AI algorithms we're using. And the answer is yes, there are other companies offering, um, there are companies so, uh, that offer such, such services. As I think there are two algorithms that are FDA approved and maybe three or four that are CMAX so to be used in, in the European Union. Um, I. I'm not going to name name because any will be favorites. I'm sure I'm, sure I'm going to, to forget some, but you have you have products you can um, you can uh, license. Though, as uh, as maybe as I, I will show I will show during a, the presentation, uh, by far more, it's mostly DR. You have countless products for DR out there, and they are getting better all the time. But for glaucoma, there are very few, and the performance in terms of glaucoma detection is uh, nowhere near as good as this for DR grading. And this is mostly a product of how DR, how difficult DR is to diagnose based on just from this photograph. Um, but this is certainly something that, that exists and there's both for fundus for photograph, but also from disco cities. You have some algorithms that just look at disco cities as well. Right, so if just for clarity, our system is the Pegasus system, formerly known as the company Visualytics, which is, um, now part of uh, the Orbis family. And so the Pegasus, the, the Pegasus system uh, that we have for you is free. <laughs> Always a nice selling point. Uh, and uh, you can use it to your heart's content. All right, so uh, next question we have, uh, is there any AI available? Oh, wait, sorry, wrong one. When clinicians are critically evaluating an AI system, what are the key questions to achieve this scrutiny? So, so if we're looking at an AI system that's available to us, what, what do we need to be looking for? So I, I think the, um, it's very similar to, for example, if you read papers about a new drug um, that comes out, I don't know, if to treat AMD. I, I'm not an ophthalmologist, so I don't know, but let's say a, a drug to treat AMD or glaucoma. Um, first of all, if it's too good to be true, it's, probably is. So there are many, especially papers that tends to be written by uh, non-medical groups. So let's say a machine learning group that use uh, ophthalmic data as, uh, as, um, as input for their, for their work, but not necessarily ophthalmologists tend to overestimate the actual uh, performance of the algorithms. And just because, um, you know, they look at their perfect a perfect data set and they say oh yeah we got perfect performance this is what i mentioned with the google case when they deploy in thailand it was terrible even though when they tested in in practice in the lab um it was outperforming every single ophthalmologist they could uh, get their hands on so i think being very criti critical as in don't believe uh, the hype too much uh which i think holds true for any academic paper or any kind of product out there but also always look at what was used to uh, as baseline for uh, evaluation. Um, make, make sure that you're happy with the fact that, okay, what they used as what we call the, gold, uh, the ground truth, so which is a gold standard against which we compare AI is reasonable. It's not just one random person. Usually you have a panel of expert ophthalmologists or you have use additional tests. For example, with glaucoma, you can use OCT, Let's say your application is detection of glaucoma and fundus photograph. You may want to use disco CTs and visual field and everything you can to ascertain the diagnosis. Uh, and then you compare your AI versus that. Um, so it's about making sure that the data is right, um, that the evaluation seems reasonable. But also, I, as I mentioned in my talk, is I would only really trust a system that's been deployed in in the wild as part, for example, as a multi-center uh, study where 
that the company or the organization that created that system just say you go it gave it away to a various institution and they used it independently and then they came into a consensus as to how it performed yeah. on the ground with real patients and i think this is what you're after uh, there are tens of thousands of papers out there about how an algorithm is better than everyone else at, at diagnosing dr for example but as soon, as long as they're not uh, deployed on the ground and used on the ground with real patients. I don't think um, it, it's an interesting as a from an academic standpoint. So let's say you do one percent better than the previous state of the art is interesting if you're uh, pushing for machine learning improvement, for example. But when it comes to patient benefits and satisfaction and so on, um, only when it's been deployed and tested on the ground, you should uh, medically trust a. I yeah, and I, I think that's an important point. A couple, you know, a couple of things. One, you have to know what population was was the machine learning based on, right? If it was just some very small population versus a diverse population, and certainly that's something that uh, our users can help us with as as we deploy this uh, over time. Is that uh, we should be able to have a diverse collection of real world photographs that we can that we can analyze. Um, and so I think that that's a, that's a good point. And, uh, and I think, so you need to, you, you need to know what's it based on. And you, you mentioned earlier about something functioning in a laboratory setting versus functioning in a real world. And I think that's an important point because so often we find, all right, we've got the perfect image and, and now we get these great reports. But when you just start taking normal images that we get from users, then we find that there's a lot of difficulty. And, and that's just how this works. You have to have a good image and the machine has to be able, the machine learning has to be able to interpret that image. And so those are key parameters. There's another question about um, ophthalmology AI books. Are there any good AI books in ophthalmology? I mean, it's such a recent field. Has anything come out yet that you're aware of? Um, I think there's a useful answer somewhere from someone uh, recommending a couple of general books. So when it comes to AI and ophthalmology, as we said, I don't know if there are many books out there. Um, um, I, I know there are a couple in the press. So there are a couple that will come out soon um, about, about the subject. Um, I think you have, when it comes to AI and machine learning, uh, you have a few resources that hopefully we're, we're in the process of updating our page on AI and artificial intelligence on cyber side. And there will be, we're planning to put a lot of resources there. Um, so be sure to check out cyber side in maybe a month's time. Uh, there will yeah. be much more resources there. But my, so AI and ophthalmology, as you said, is probably a bit too um, uh specialized uh, as it is now uh, to have a book, especially books that are uh, non-technical and kind of for beginners. I would, uh, every year when you have uh, Arvo and other conferences, there's always a couple of tracks about AI. And I found there is a few papers that came out with those. Again, we'll reference those on the future cyber side update, but um, that are very good at explainers for kind of newcomers to when it comes to AI. Um, or going over what we just talked about, how to be critical about AI, but also giving giving the tools to understand AI and maybe do a bit of AI as well. And you have many, many tutorials out there uh, and courses. Um, there are courses for AI in ophthalmology, but as far as I understand, there are no free courses for AI in ophthalmology. So <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if to recommend them because they tend to be uh, very expensive. This is certainly something we are going to look at probably in the future as well. Uh, yeah. If there is interest in it, we can do it. But what I would recommend if you're interested in machine learning in general, don't, uh, there are a million tutorials out there how to get started on machine learning. Uh, if you go on Coursera, which is this massive learning thing, uh, there is a free machine learning course on there that is very good um, to get started on machine learning. I will not start on machine learning doing AI stuff because you're going to struggle, uh, doing ophthalmology stuff, sorry. Yeah. You're going to struggle finding the data and it's not going to be right. I would start with, as I showed, cats and dogs photos that you find everywhere that are, and you have data sets already exist, you can very easily download and, and start experimenting with. So uh, again, more of these uh, resources will be on that uh, cyber site page at some point when we get time to update it. 
Yeah, I think that, you know, in terms of uh, the medical practice of AI ophthalmology, it's going to change so fast, but by the time a book would be published, it's, it's going to be out of, uh, out of date already. So I think Nicholas is right. You know, if you want to learn about machine learning and have a basic grasp of the concepts, that's pretty reasonable to get a book for. But to say, I'm going to learn about AI and ophthalmology from a book, it's going to be outdated. This is going to change way faster than that. Yep. All right. Uh, next question is, uh, considering how difficult, challenging it can be to make a diagnosis of early glaucoma, to what extent is AI currently useful in this regard? And I'll, I'll answer this one. Uh, from a clinician standpoint, um, I would not rely on AI to make your diagnosis of glaucoma, right? What's this going to do? It's, it's, it's going to be a, a screening or a monitoring tool, all right? So um, a diagnosis of early glaucoma is an elevated intraocular pressure with changes to the eye right? You need those two things. So you can't make that diagnosis with AI. You can highlight disc abnormalities that bring the patient to your attention, um, but you can't make the diagnosis of glaucoma. So I think that's where the use is, is at this point, largely as a screening tool for glaucoma. In the next phase, as a monitoring tool for glaucoma changes to the optic nerve, or monitoring OCT changes over time, et cetera, or visual field changes over time. So that's the next evolution of a glaucoma AI package. All right, um, next question. OCT images poor at detecting progression in glaucoma and AMD. Um, this is more of a statement I'm going to, uh, defer that one. Let's see, what else do we have here? Can AI replace a technician and optometry in the future? Well, no, I don't think so. I don't think AI is going to replace anything. Um, you know, this, this is a supplement. The there's been such an explosion of information in medicine that we all have information overload. The, the, the purpose of AI is to one, bring patients to our attention to screening, two, make your job easier. But, um, but I don't think anyone in the near future expects AI to do anything in place of a technician or an optometrist. You, you need hands-on. This is just supplementing, closing the loop. Yeah, and certainly at, at CyberSight and Orbis in general, I think we are looking at AI, as you said, as a uh, decision support tool rather than, you know, something that will replace humans at doing what they do. Um, so we are really into making sure you have the best possible information when you have to make a decision regarding a patient. And this is, I think, where AI shines really. Uh, here's a question. How about... AI for cataract staging? Um, I think that, again, I'm not aware of a commercial product, but I'm, I definitely seen papers on it. And I think there's just been a release of a data set on it uh, as part of a, one of these challenges I was talking about, benchmarks and challenges. Uh, I think there is a challenge about cataract detection now. I'm not sure about staging, but certainly detection. So. Um, and the typical trend is when you start seeing academic papers on this, um, a few years later, you will see products and features on, you know, on platforms such as ours. But um, certainly as long, but at least the question to any of, uh, to the answer to any of this question is, if there are data, out, if there is data out there for this particular condition in a sufficient amount, so let's say, is this relatively doable to uh, collect, I don't know, 10,000 of examples or something? then I can guarantee you somewhere someone is working in algorithm to, to solve that problem. Right. And here's another question uh, related to glaucoma screening. And this has to do with, I would like to see how it performs in small and large discs where if accurate, it could be helpful. So if the optic nerve is larger than normal or smaller than normal, does the machine learning take that into account or is it kind of limited to the cup to disc ratio at this point? 
So the way we uh, diagnose um, abnormal desk uh, is two ways. Is through, as you said, that we have the VCDR computation, uh, which is very explicit. It shows you how it computes it, so it can verify it or reject it very easily. You have the second bit, which is a classification algorithm, which is more, much more black boxy. You get a, some some kind of visualization, but it's not, you know, it, most of quite often is not that useful and that black boxy algorithm will certainly take that into account because it was trained, as I mentioned, when you train your algorithm with a bunch of data, uh, it will learn implicitly to, to do this, to take into account the size of the disk. So it's not trivial because the size of the disk, how do you evaluate this without, you know, if you have a non-calibrated camera, so you don't know what a pixel is in absolute measurements, how do you even start so you can, they will find algorithms, this type of deep learning algorithm will typically find a way and maybe use a disk so that as a vessel as a reference of to evaluate some kind of scale. Um, that being said, we are there is ongoing research uh, in academia, in uh, uh, as part of a commercial organization, and also in what we do as to how to improve that and make it much more granular and explicitly take into account the size of the disk. So right. right now it's probably implicit. It does it somehow we can't really verify, but we're going to make it so that at some point we'll have something we can look at and be told by the algorithm exactly how it, come, it came to a conclusion. Right. And I think that that's one of the, the kind of uh, near future evolutions is not only does a AI system give you a report, but there's an educational component that goes along with that that says, okay, this, this is what we're reporting and here's the reason why um, this report is abnormal, not just highlighting it. So that's, that's a great point and a great evolution that's in the near future. Someone had wondered uh, in this question, they say, I see you submitted both a normal and a sus suspected abnormal image for AI analysis. Is this required? Could the normal image be supplied as baseline by CyberSight? So, no, it's absolutely not required. I simply submitted a normal so that you would see what a normal report looks like. And, uh, and again, that normal and that glaucoma suspect were, were not, the same, um, not the same patient, just simply taking two images to show you what the report's like and not have to submit multiple reports for the uh, sake of time during our presentation. So no, um, any image, doesn't you don't need to have a normal in there. All right, scrolling through more uh, questions here. It says, what is the success rate of say cyber say AI when the image is of optimal quality? Uh, so that will depend on which bit we're looking at, whether it's optic disk or um, DR grading, uh, or just anomaly detection. I think we'll that's something we want to be much more transparent on on the future. And I, the, in the um, update I mentioned uh, of CyberSide, the artificial intelligence page on CyberSide is something we want to be transparent on and provide figures. Um, generally speaking, we are similar. Uh, the, for example, the grading and uh, the grading performance for DR is more or less si similar to a expert ophthalmologist or a grader. Um, that being said, I get don't trust what I say because I say don't trust people that <laughs> say they match or exceed a, uh, a human performance. So in very controlled environment, this is what we, uh, we see. Uh, for glaucoma, um, much more difficult to ascertain because of the variability between experts, but we are within the range of experts typically. Uh, so we, when we ask multiple experts, um, typically cybersat AI is some, somewhere in between of all these experts. So it's within reason, but again, it's very difficult to say uh, exactly how we're doing in comparison because there's so much viability. Um, we are pretty good for anomaly detection. So for example, the macula anomaly, um, as soon as it deviates from what we expect a normal macula to look like, it's really good at highlighting this. Even it's very subtle cues as well, such as for example, a macula hole. Um, even if it's a tiny macula hole, will tend to be picked up by the AI. Um, so yeah, we all in all, we are pretty much similar to what um, human experts would do. Though, again, 
is that take that with a grain of salt. It varies greatly with quality. So uh, performance degrades quickly with quality. And um, that's our next that's our next question, actually. How much yeah. does image quality affect the reliability of the results? Well, I mean, it affects it greatly, right? If you put in a bad picture, uh, you're going to get bad results. Uh, that's that's pretty much an automatic. You give me a bad patient history, I'm probably going to give you bad feedback and bad diagnosis and bad information as a teacher. So I think this is no different. You just have to have um, as good of a quality of image as you can. And I think what's important, if, if, if you put in a bad image, we're not gonna send you a report that um, has bad information. You're, that, bad in, that bad image is going to be flagged and you're going to be told this is a bad image this information is not reliable to our level of satisfaction. So keep that in mind. Don't, don't interpret. Um, we'll give you the report, but we're going to tell you this is not a reliable report because the image is not sufficient. And you can resubmit if you have the ability to get a better image. All right. So definitely affects it. It has to. All right. Um, this is about artifact. Humans need two images to identify a camera artifact. Can AI identify artifacts with only one image? So it will identify it, right? But it's not going to tell you it's artifact, right, Nicholas? Correct. And that's only true. So some of the facts are quite obvious. So we talk about, let's say, um, lighting, uh, lighting uh, artifacts where you have a huge region of your image that oversaturated that will be very easily identified. The um, kind of edge cases become, for example, with macronism detection. And let's say you have dust on your lens. And um, it's the only way for a human to make sure that this is uh, dust and not a macronism is to like at, basically look at two images of the, you know, of two different patients, if it's the exact same location, then you'll say, yeah, this must be dust rather than macronism. Uh, we have ways around it, and there's some clever ways around it, but the answer is, we cannot be 100% resilient to it. There is always some, uh, for example, dust in some cases is very, very similar in the visual features. Even though we have system in place to avoid this, um, if it's very similar and how the way it looks and a pixel level to a macronism, there's almost nothing you can do except using two images, which we can do, but not in, in the context of cyber side consult. Right, and, and, and of course, Again, this is the ground floor of this, this, um, this future ability, right? So you're going to see the machine learning gets refined, the ability to accept a wider variety of images or filter out things like artifact. That's going to come with time. Um, um, here's another question. Can AI help in the differential diagnosis of retinal and optic nerve pathologies? Well, I think this is what I would like to see. Um, I, I think that right now we have a great, great screening tool. Um, as a clinician, uh, one of my goals with our future development is, okay, we screened and we found this anomaly and we've given you some baseline grading information. Now, Mr. AI, how about giving me um, a list of differential diagnoses I need to consider and, and then once once I've picked a diagnosis based on these suggestions you're giving me, um, how's the best way for me to treat this? And, and so if any of you use the Will's Eye Manual, that's what that Will's Eye Manual does. It, you, you, you input a finding and then it suggests possible diagnoses and, and, and ways to rule in and out each of those diagnoses. And then once you've narrowed it down, you get a treatment algorithm. And that's where I see us going in the future is this is now assisting that your care of the patient once this diagnosis is made. So I think that's gonna be terribly exciting. Um, all right, you touched on this, Nicholas, who can use this service and how do I get access, right? So we have different kinds of accounts. Yep, so uh, when you go and sign up for Cybersite, uh, for a Cybersite account, so first of all, you need a Cybersite account. Um, then uh, when you sign up, you have the choice between different accounts and the base level is basically just accessing the learning material, uh, which doesn't require any more 
validation step, I think you just get the account uh, created there and then. Um, when you can choose um, online courses plus also consultations, so kind of doing access to CyberSight Consult, which is a telemedicine platform. Um, and this will require some, uh, some approval process as we, um, for various reasons, we need to check uh, that you are a clinician or a healthcare professional or someone with the uh, background to, you know, make the most of that information and uh, use that information in a way that will not be uh, detrimental. So they make sure that if you don't have a CyberSat account yet, create one and you take that option that you want access to the consult application as well. Um, uh, if you already have a CyberSat account, but uh, that is only for learning materials, but you want also to have access to consult and the AI functionality, then uh, just contact our support, uh, which I think is support.icybersci.org, and then we'll walk you through the different steps needed. Right. So we can help you get converted to a consult um, um, user. Now, keep in mind, the consultation service that Orbis provides is, is restricted to certain countries, all right? Uh, the purpose of what Orbis does uh, with the consult service is to assist physicians without mentors in low to middle income countries. And so um, if you're in the United States, you, you have access to all the learning materials, but you don't have access to the consult system. Um, will it be possible all right, someone here, uh, here's a question from the Philippines. Will it be possible to use the AI only feature by uploading sample photographs from the internet so that I can practice? That's kind of a mixed bag. That doesn't usually work, does it, Nicholas? Uh, well, I think that if you find images uh, that are of high enough resolution, uh, for example, there's this one image that everyone uses. I think it's a Wikipedia article on the fundus photograph. Literally, the fundus article on Wikipedia has like a normal eye. And then it has like, I think it's a glaucomatous eye or a DRI. These two images that everyone uses when they test the AI system. Um, they are very high resolution and good quality. So I think um, although the system is mostly designed for you to um, upload your own data so that you use a system and then you get the report and then that report informs your decision when it comes to your patients. Um, I think it's acceptable because there's no mentor involved in the, in the loop uh, by default. Uh, it's, it's acceptable to upload uh, example data if you want, for example, to get used to the system. So um, you can, in order to avoid maybe overloading the system with data that is not real patient data, you can also go to um, cybersci.org. And I think if you go in consult and artificial intelligence, it will show you how to use the system, at least for patient cases and how to interpret the, um, the AI uh, report as well. So I, I say if it's one or two images, go for it. And if you get a feel for the system, but please don't upload like a, a thousand, you know, uh, non, uh, random images from the internet. Right, don't crash our system, but... Uh... <laughs> Feel free. Yeah, I think it's perfectly reasonable to play around with it and, and do a couple samples so you can see how it works. Uh, and it, depending on the images, it may or may not work, um, depending on your resolution, etc. So um, uh, just, to, yeah. just, to, just to clarify, please don't do this on consult uh, a patient case. Yeah, do True. that only right. on AI, AI only cases. Um, that's, a, that's a good point. Yeah, we don't want it going to one of our mentors and sending them um, distracting things. All right, uh, next question is your, oh, and I just un, undid it. Um, okay, the question was, is your, uh, is your AI system able to do OCT images or follow OCT images over time? So we have OCT capabilities, um, as in we can, for example, take an OCT cube. We can work with a single slice, but typically it will be a whole cube. Uh, they are macula-centered cubes and not disc-centered cubes. and we can detect stuff like AMD, wet and dry. We can quantify the thickness of layers. The caveat to that is this is not available on consult yet, um, just because consult is really, uh, as Dan mentioned, for low to middle income countries, or OCT is not as prevalent. So we want to really focus on funders photograph for now and get the system working as well as possible uh, with images um, and 2D images before 
we start rolling out you know the full thing with OCT because then it com increased complexity and everything. So right. the answer is yes. And it is possible there's a lot of work going on with OCT in addition to Fundus. But for now, we're only supporting uh, Fundus Photograph. Right, so that's, uh, that's uh, to be determined, but obviously we all have that um, goal in mind. Uh, we, we all think that that would be useful. So um, yes, expect changes constantly, and that will be one of them, I'm sure. Um, here's another question comment. I think that combining smartphone fundoscopy with CyberSate AI would be a game changer for ophthalmology and a cheap one too. And uh, also thanking us for helping out. Well, we totally agree with you and trust me, uh, this, we realize that that's what needs to happen, right? I mean, you see that on these fundus photo, the fundus cameras question, only about half uh, of us have access to a good fundus camera. What we, what we really need, and there are several variations out there, is the ability to take an easy, fast, accurate smartphone fundus photograph. Um, yeah, either the Fundus or Slit Lamp Photograph. And, it, and once we get to a product that's really good, that's consistent, and that we can all um, access, that is going to be a game changer for ophthalmology. And I think right now that's the major hurdle with uh, a fair amount of telemedicine for ophthalmology is is the we need something to to with a smartphone image the eye and we're getting there but i would say that a lot of stuff's not quite ready for prime time yet it's coming yep. all right uh let's see how do you think this will shape ophthalmic training in the next 10 years well, that's an interesting question. I, I do think that what well, you see it already with the simulation tools that are out there. Um, Nicholas, do you have any thoughts on how this is going to shape training? So that's something we are working on and thinking very hard about. I think, as I mentioned during my slide, I think diagnostics and prediction is one area where AI is useful. And this is kind of the low hanging fruit, which is why this is probably the first things that people think about and, deep and productize and sell. Um, I, I do think there's a lot of potential for AI in mentoring. So as we mentioned, if you have an algorithm that's granular enough to show you exactly why it came to a conclusion, for example, we're going back to that disk size and yeah. uh, for glaucoma detection. Um, if your algorithm is so granular that it tells you exactly step by step how it came to that conclusion, rather than telling you yes or no. Um, I think this could be a very powerful training tool uh, because then you could imagine um, anyone in the spare time just you know, uploading a bunch of images and learning from this. And, um, and also, I think this is also kind of the low hanging fruit. I think there's much more that can be done uh, going from you know, personalized courses uh, that adapt to your needs and experience and create a course material on the go, basically, on the fly, based on what exactly you need to learn. Um, a lot of AI work these days about generation of images. Can we generate like random images of DR patients with exact, you know, if you say, oh, I want to see what progression from DR, uh, from, you know, moderate to severe to proliferative DR looks like, you will have a hard time because finding these images in the wild is very difficult. But I'm sure there will be AI algorithms that will allow you to do that very easily in a manner right. that's very realistic. So a lot to go. I think we haven't even started to explore what can be done with for training, but I'm sure that will be a huge thing in the future, not just diagnostic, diagnostics and clinical decision support. Right. And I think a lot of the AI training is going to be clinically oriented. So you, you're, you're submitting a consult on... Uh, on uh, Percher's retinopathy and the AI system recognizes that you put in the word Percher's and then it brings up, uh, um, here's a nice summary review article on Percher's retinopathy, right? So lots of ways to link in information with the medical diagnosis process. Um, and, and so I think that's, that's what AI is going to do. It's going to call um, educational material and present it to you based on, on what you're currently doing. Now, this is just a general background question about um, how AI was developed. Um, 
Nicholas, can you give a short summary of the when this started and how long it took to come up with a, a viable system? So um, very briefly and, you know, uh, skipping a lot of uh, important steps here, but um, machine learning has been a thing for a very long time. I mentioned uh, deep learning and convolutional neural network that are used in modern kind of machine vision, computer vision, AI systems. Uh, these artificial neural networks have been described in the 80s and 90s. Um, it's just so that, as I turned out that you needed a lot of data and computational power to make uh, good use of them that we didn't have back then. Uh, which is why um, machine learning kind of progressed until uh, uh, 2010 or so. And there was a lot of progress, but it was very slow progress. So every year you were chipping away as his benchmarks, like chipping 1% away every year. Um, and then all of a sudden you have this, this um, uh, deep learning and convolutional ne neural networks that came around in 2012. And then this is where everything changed. And um, uh, AI, even though it's not true AI, it's a good approximation of it. But I would say 2012 is when all of these uh, things I describe in my slides, a key landmark moments, they just, they all came from that point in time in 2012 when deep learning was really introduced to the world. And then nowadays, everything used to, uh, uses deep learning, every single AI system. And it's part of our lives now, you know, we. Can we go to your Google Assistant or Siri or do a Google search? It's all deep learning based nowadays. So it's a huge, it was a huge change. And this is definitely, I think, what we would see in the future when we have true AI at some point. Um, 2012 would probably be the day that will be in history books as, you know, when the day it all started. For better or worse, I hope the outcome will be good with AI in the long term. Um, but that will be probably when uh, all that started, yeah. Right. All right. Um, I've scrolled through to the end of the questions, and um, and I, I think at this point we've answered most of people's questions directly, or at least something related to it. Um, so I may start to bring us to a to a close here. Um, I will end on this last question, though. Can we depend fully on this, or do we need to recheck? Well. Nicholas, should we just take it at its word or? Yeah, uh, I would say no. And this is why um, we, for example, to get access to it, you need some kind, some kind of um, uh, clinical background because we want to make sure that you have the capability to come uh, to, to be critical about it. As no AI system is perfect, certainly ours isn't. Uh, so you, there are always a chance of false positive, false negative. So having right. this is an aid and this is not uh, autonomous decision making so right you know. right you're you're still the doctor you still have to take the information you have to make a decision this is another tool and like any tool it's not going to be perfect you have to take it for what it is and um, ultimately take all the information and the fact that the patient's there with you and make your decision okay and when you're not sure about that that's where the mentorship side comes from and the ability to kick it down uh, to someone with more experience and so uh, we do want everyone to use this feature we want you to have realistic expectations we want you to take good fundus images so that we can help you as much as possible and we want you to stay tuned because this is just going to change month by month and so don't be frustrated that this is all we're offering now because this is just going to change and it's just going to be part of what we do. So uh, Nicholas, thank you for your great presentation there at the beginning and certainly all the hard work that you're doing um, for Orbis CyberSight. And uh, this is just going to be an amazing adventure. I appreciate it. Thanks, Dan. It was great. Thank you. All right. With that, we will close out our webinar and uh, thank you for everyone's attendance today.